All right, here we go. And of course we're doing um, the Torah portion Yitro, which it looks like I forgot to actually put on the first PowerPoint, but it is Yitro. And I just wanna pick up where I left off last night. I felt like I did a really nice self-contained lesson last night, which is really hard to do. <laughs> Um, typically, it's just one big lesson over two days. So basically, our premise last night is how do we hold on to the experience that we had at C9? Because we all had one. Uh, they were there, we were there, and we are there, and we will be there. And you know, to, to experience the thunder, the lightning, the fire, the smoke, the earthquakes, the violently rushing wind, all of those things that accompanied that, um, we would have been terrified, just like the Israelites. We would have been terrified if we had been experiencing, you know, all those things simultaneously and then visually seeing the, the sound of his voice the sound of the shofar, literally seeing the words, we would have been terrified. You know, it, it wouldn't have been, you know, just like sitting in the movie, watching Charlton Heston, uh, eating popcorn. It would have been much different had we been there. And so forever, the Israelites had that shared experience. They knew the Torah as it was spoken with thunder, as it was spoken with lightning. And we each experienced that in some way. When the truth and the power of the Torah penetrated into our hearts, when it hit us like a bolt of lightning, when you know we trembled with the realization of how much we've missed in terms of his word and how defective we are as human beings at taking his word inside of us. And we have that realization and then we realize, can I even stand right here? You know, in, in my present state, how can I even stand under this mountain and listen to these words? And of course, the tradition tells us they didn't. They actually kept dying on him. After each uh, commandment rolled out, uh, they would actually die and have to be resurrected. And we're going to look at that again. Uh, but how do we hold on to that? That was the main idea last night. When we go out into the world, how will our words be any different from anyone else's who might say, do not steal, do not murder, do not, do not commit adultery? Those are common moralities. Those are common ethics. Unless we can speak the words with thunder, and unless we can hold on to the thunder with which we received the words, there's really nothing to distinguish us. Um, and that's why I think with Acts chapter two, we get the idea of how we are empowered and how we must go out. Um, so, okay. Um, one of our things about the eagle that we might revisit is that um, Adonai compares himself to an eagle taking them out of Egypt. And one of the characteristics of an eagle is something that the Israelites would have needed in that particular wilderness, which is protection from serpents. And one quality of the eagle in that area, um, this is the golden eagle that's down in that area of the Tzin wilderness, is that they will kill snakes, even poisonous snakes. They will kill them, uh, which is nice. Okay, I'm gonna flip ahead here till we get to our spot. And, and that was pretty much our last point, how in Acts chapter two, the, the people from all the nations were hearing the disciples speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They weren't talking in casual terms. They were talking about mighty things that happened. And at Sinai, this is exactly what Moses was supposed to say to Israel, you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. This is the process of being brought out of a state of death. And once he's brought you out of a state of death, then he needs to bring you to Sinai to prepare you for the state of life. 
of bringing you so that you can cross back into the garden, so you can cross into what is the land of Israel in its, its most fulfilled state, not in the fallen state that we typically see it. So he brings them into the wilderness to prepare them, and it's the same. were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of a serpent and that's important because as long as they were in the cloud which is what we have an expectation of is that at this next resurrection Yeshua being the the prototype the first fruit from the dead, that when we follow at some future Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, just like we hear the trumpets at the mountain, and they saw the cloud, we saw the cloud at the mountain, that once again we will hear the shofar and then we will enter into the cloud to be in his presence, when it will no longer be a judgment should we accidentally even touch the mountain, when his presence is there. Instead, once we come to an agreement, then when the call goes out, we will be able to cross and to touch without being shot by that divine arrow or being um, stoned by divine power, as we saw in Revelation. So, like I said, it's if they were to break through and to touch the mountain, it's not that Moses would have somebody standing there to shoot them with arrows or a bunch of people pick up rocks and throw at them, it would have actually been a divine reaction. There would have been a divine rider, the rider of that white horse in Revelation who carries a bow, who would have shot them through. It would have been a divine power of rocks falling on them, just like it says in Revelation, the people were begging for the rocks to fall on them uh, because they, they knew they were subject to the wrath. So, in the wilderness is our preparation to enter in. Where they've come from, they have seen the other side. They have seen the death side of things. Whereas they are going into a state where they have to prepare for three days of purity. They have to separate from their wives if they're married for a specific reason that we'll look at at the end. But in Egypt, those who were not genuine Hebrews. In other words, they literally believed that they could be brought out of Egypt and they literally believed that they could be brought into the land of Israel. Remember the rabbis say it's in that darkness that the disbelieving Israelites were pretty much weeded out so that they wouldn't discourage the rest of them when it was time to leave. Uh, but the three days of darkness to the Egyptians, remember it was tangible. It was something you could feel. The rabbis say it was almost like a gel that would envelop you. And it would freeze you, not as in temperature, but as in activity. It would freeze you right where you were. And it says they were unable to rise from their place. And so it's when you're in a condition of death, at least if you are in Egypt, if, if you're identified with the wicked, with the rebellious, with the stubborn and so forth, once you die, you are really unable to rise, like it says, from your place, because your place is different from Israel's place. Remember, he brought Israel, the woman, into the wilderness to nourish her, but he says he brought her to her place. Her place is different from Egypt's place. So if you're stuck in Egypt, at death, then you're unable to rise at that point, nor are you able to change the condition in which the darkness found you. In other words, the way you went into that is the way that it holds you in death. And of course, the, there's a three-day period there. Um, alternatively, if we look over to the Hebrew neighborhood, they have light even while they are in death. Okay, and that requires you to think about that for just a second. At this point, the Hebrews are still in Egypt. They are still in Avadon and destruction. They're still in a state of death. Nevertheless, even in that place, even while they are dead, they had light for three days while they awaited the resurrection. So we've got this 
period of three days that represents resurrection. And likewise, when the Hebrews make it to Sinai, they are going to prepare for the revelation of life for three, for three days of separation. So the idea here, whether you're thinking in terms of, I have prepared for death by living in death, or I have prepared for death by living in life, in which case I will be dead, but in a much different type of death than the wicked. And it's going to freeze you in place. In other words, if you lived a life of wickedness, you will continue in that state. And if you lived a life of holiness, then you will continue in that state. If you lived death in death, then you will retain those characteristics of death. If you lived life even in death, then you will retain those characteristics of life even after you die. So your death is a different experience than the wicked. And in Revelation 22, 11, it, it kind of verifies this approach, uh, which says, let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who's filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And this is what we're seeing in this contrast between Egypt or death and Sinai and life. The, the commandments of life, the tree of life. They're about to take hold of that tree of life. So they're preparing in holiness. And they've already been practicing at least a proto-righteousness, even before the, the actual contract is extended, the covenant is extended, they're already practicing degrees of righteousness in this salvation from Egypt. And so... Their intent at the mountain is to go on being righteous and go on being holy and actually growing in it because now they're going to get even more commandments concerning righteousness and they're going to get even more commandments concerning holiness. And so they can actually continue to grow in it. But for the wicked or the one who does wrong and the one who's filthy and the one who's happy with that condition, they're pretty much frozen in that state. Um, I don't, we don't want to call it growth because it really isn't growth. It's just extended death. Things like righteousness and holiness are things that grow because they're from the side of life, not from the side of death. So, the words of the Torah at Sinai offered with flashing lightning, with words that were also tangible, words you could see. They're offered with light. And what, it, what the offer is, is a dwelling place of the cloud from which these words are spoken. Remember this, this heavy, thick cloud that these words are coming from with thunder. And we get that again in Revelation. Nothing has changed in the book of Revelation from the Revelation at Sinai. And the offer is here. There is the, I'm offering you words of life. I'm offering you this opportunity basically for an upgrade on this flight. And we know that this is the paradigm for the cloud that will one day speak again. There will be a voice from the cloud that says, come up here. Even in Revelation, we see the, the two witnesses where they're resurrected come up here. And we're told, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will be returned to his presence. And so at the same time that the Egyptians of the world and the Babylonians of the world are experiencing a thick darkness, instead for the righteous and the holy, it will be light. And so the words that are going to be offered at Sinai are offering a different experience after death. Instead of being frozen in whatever state of wickedness we may have been found, now we have the offer of continuing in a state of righteousness that actually does offer growth opportunities. 
where we can actually continue to be like a tree that would bear fruit in the garden instead of being that burned up tree. And so in Revelation uh, 22, 17, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one, I can't see, and let the one who hears, and that's exactly what they said, we will do and we will hear. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. So again, we can go back to Yeshua's parable of the rich man and Lazarus and, and unpack some things from that. One thing the rich man complained of was that the flame was tormenting him. And in last week's lesson, we looked at the psalm where it talks about how what we experience in Sheol, if we were in Sheol, would be a feeling of being surrounded by lions. And so if we look at these two things together, then we see this rich man is having this experience of being tormented because remember the flames of the lions were actually words and he, he, he compares those words also to arrows. Uh, James refers to the tongue as a fire that's, that's coming from hell that's set on fire of hell it says but also along with that we have these symbols of the arrows and the sword that are coming out of the song. What does it mean to be in Sheol? To be surrounded by lions, beings, that are using words to torment you. Thirst has, we can directly reference, when the spirit and the bride say, come, let the one who is thirsty come. That is a specific reference to the song of Moses, to the Torah. Because remember, when Moses begins to sing the song, the first words are that they should receive these words of the Torah like dew on thirsty grass. And also like rain. And so we know that dew is a symbol of resurrection. And so when you receive his word, when you receive Yeshua like your thirsty grass, then you're receiving the song of Moses. You're receiving the Torah. You were thirsting for the proper thing because the grass has to be thirsty in order to absorb the dew of resurrection. Thirsting for the word will cost you something in this life. When you hunger and thirst for the word, you're gonna pay for it. And it might be monetary, it might be paying tuition for classes. It might be paying for books. It might be paying for gasoline to go attend Bible studies or classes. It might mean you have to forego income for taking off on a Shabbat or a feast. There could be a monetary assessment where you are literally paying money in order to receive the due but it can also be less tangible things. It can be you give up something in a relationship. You might give up some sort of acclimation. Um, I'm thinking of the baseball player from way back. What was his name? Uh, he was Jewish. He was not a religious Jew, but he never would play baseball on Yom Kippur. And when he was in the World Series, they thought, you know, this will this will make a difference and no it didn't um he did not play on yom kippur so even though i'm sure it cost him a lot of money um it maybe cost him a lot of esteem of his fans not to play on such an important day um, i think of that old movie chariots to fire the runner who wouldn't run on his sabbath even though it probably wasn't shabbat i don't remember the movie that well it was a moral imperative to him that I'm willing to pay something. I'm willing to forego an award, a medal, winning, being on the winning team. These sorts of things we might be called upon. If we thirst more for the word, if we're willing to pay more for the word, um, 
than to receive other sorts of payment. So it does cost something in this life, but Yeshua, the spirit and the bride, if they will thirst for the word, for the Torah in this life, when they enter into the garden, when, when they're able to say, come, Bo. At that point, there's no more cost. You've already paid the price. And, and that takes you again to the, the 10 virgins. You've got the wise virgins, you've got the foolish virgins. And the wise ones say something strange to the foolish ones. They say, you have to go buy some for yourself. And you're, you're thinking, buy it? Well, in Hebrew, buy and acquire are the same word, kone. But the thing is, they had already made the sacrifices for the extra oil. Once the bridegroom comes, you can't go out and buy it. In other words, there's no more time for sacrifice because there is no more time. So that's where you get frozen, where you are. Uh, whatever you have prepared for Shabbat is what you enjoy on Shabbat. Whatever you have prepared before the bridegroom comes is what you take into the, the marriage celebration. So thirsting does cost you something in this life. In the world to come, it's going to be free. But for those who rejected the command to hear, O Israel, there's no way to purchase it after that. It doesn't, we're not saying they're not saved. That's a completely different discussion. But in terms of what they can enjoy, because they paid the price in this life, there's, there's really not a makeup day. It has to have already been started in this life. Now, according to the rabbis, if you started it in this life, then you can finish it. But if you never started, there's nothing to finish. What is, is. And you don't have enough money. I saw an interesting cartoon. I don't remember who sent it to me. Maybe it was Tashanda? I don't know. But it was an interesting cartoon of this guy with all his money bags going into heaven. And basically, he had to throw the money bags into a big pile because the money doesn't cross the boundary. Your, your money, your esteem, your medals, your awards, your, you know, whatever you acquire in this life, you basically dump it at the door. And then it's going to be those, those spiritual things that you're not going to be able to shake off. And then you're going to realize that what you built in the spiritual realm is what is waiting for you on that other side because it was faith you couldn't see it but you can't go in and and purchase it because that's just a, a unique position of being human in this life um, so in revelation 9 8 again going back to the teeth of lions revelation 9 8 says that the supernatural bugs of king avadon they have teeth that says like the teeth of lions. And in Psalm 57, 4, that we read last week, remember it says, my soul, which is the part of you um, that's in question after you die. We know where your body is. Um, as far as your spirit, there's no problem there. But it's the soul, the nefesh, that's a question. And so the writer says, my soul, my nefesh, is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. So, you know, that really gives you the impression that those who died in wickedness, they keep running their heads in hell. <laughs> they might be dead, and they're still speaking words of death. They're still on the attack. Um, and, and they're referred to as lions breathing forth fire. And then it identifies um, what's happening. They're still using words, arrows, and swords in order to inflict damage. Um, I don't know how you take damage after death. That's part of the experience. I don't know that we can understand or that we would even want to. Um, 
but the tongue is a world of iniquity that, it, that James says is set on fire of hell. This is not the same kind of fire. The fire that's being breathed out in Sheol is not the same fire that's falling from above that we saw in Acts chapter two, because when the fire falls from above, remember it's Yeshua's testimony. It speaks of the mighty deeds of Adonai as he brings people out of Egypt. And in the, the more spiritual sense, he brings humankind out of a state of death. And that message is each given in one's own language, like it was at Sinai, so it was at Shavuot. And so when we speak in tongues, we're talking about words, whether it's the words of lions and Sheol, or whether it's the divine words speaking of the mighty deeds. And so when people ask who is the bride, the easiest thing to point back to is Revelation 22, 17, which is actually the beginning of the song of Moses, which is what why they're still singing it in Revelation. Let the one, the spirit and the bride say, come, the one who hears, hears what? Shema Yisrael, Ha'azinu, the song of Moses. Let the one who hears say, Bo, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So they're all saying the same message here. And it's the one who is thirsty. That's just the simplest explanation of the bride because the spirit is in the bride. And the spirit is what causes us in this lifetime to be thirsty for the word because the words are spirit. And so if you have been thirsty in this life and you have lived a life that is characterized by that thirst for the word, then you enter in and you start to take the water of life, this time without cost. It's without suffering. Um, but you have to suffer a type of poverty in order to obtain it. In some translations, it'll say purchase. But if you can say come, it's because you have thirsted for life. Understanding that this is a walk of faith and that your thirst for life, your thirst for the word, your thirst for righteousness, your thirst for holiness, you will always yearn for it in this life, but it's only going to be satisfied after this life or at resurrection, because then we will be drinking from the living rivers of Eden. Because remember, Yeshua, he's our passage over. He's the living word. And when we reach the garden, those words will not torment us. Right? If you just think, if you're in a state of death and you have a realization that you had an opportunity at the words of life, if you were to continue to hear the words of life, it would actually be a torment to you. But at this point, it's going to be really difficult for a rich person to say, come. And we're not talking about rich in money. We're talking about a person who was self-sufficient without the word. A person who was self-sufficient without the Holy Spirit empowering them. A person who was self-sufficient because they were unwilling to make the sacrifices and experience the suffering that has to come if we thirst after the word. They'll actually be frozen in that state, like we say, just stuck in darkness. And they're not going to be able to quench their thirst because their thirst that they developed over their lifetime was for a physical soul pleasuring thing or things. And while we are created to have those cravings and to be able to satisfy those cra cravings within the boundaries of the word, if we never developed a taste for living water, if we never had that, that boundary of the rivers of Eden, which is the word, if we didn't respect those boundaries and we transgress those boundaries, then we would fall into the category of the rich 
because in order to remain in those boundaries, there's a certain poverty of the soul that we have to experience in order to enrich the spirit in that area of life. So this, there's a concept that's usually presented with hearing and doing the Torah. Even if you look at the Shema, who are you supposed to share it with? Well, primarily with your children, but basically with everyone because it covers everywhere you might go in a day from sun up to sun down. The Torah, speaking the words of the Torah, and sizing those words on our hearts is a shared experience. If you notice, even though Moses had a conversation with the Holy One and a burning bush all by himself and maybe with a few sheep, he didn't receive the Torah alone. He didn't receive it until he returned to that place to worship with all Israel. And so for him, it was even partial until the whole nation can stand at the mountain. In the same way, these people, they're not just making covenant as individuals. They had to have a shared experience. If we're talking about Torah, we're talking about a shared experience. We're not, we're individually accountable, but you cannot do it alone. And in fact, um, there's a midrash that says Hashem held the mountain over their heads, which comes from the language of they stood under the mountain. And they had no choice but to promise obedience. And so what does that represent? Whether it's literal, whether it isn't, um, it demonstrates that they had a negative fear of divine punishment and death Basically, at the moment, they're agreeing and saying, we will do and we will hear. Well, if there's a mountain over your head, or if there's this impending sense of punishment and death hanging over you, you're going to be very quick to say, whatever you say, I will do it. Seriously, whatever you name it, I will do it. But there was a better relationship. And Paul writes of this in a, in a very rabbinic treatise to the Galatians, he writes of this Sinai relationship metaphorically, and he calls it Hagar, because Hagar was a servant. Sarah was Abraham's loving wife. And when she obeyed him, as Peter says, calling him Lord, which it sounds way worse in our generation than it would have back then, but basically showing him respect, not because she was forced to, but because she wanted to. She wants to show respect to her spouse. Hagar is, is simply finding a way out of the, the relationship of slavery that she's in. She's trying to earn this way out of slavery, but there's a, there's a certain fear of punishment that comes with not cooperating. How much choice does Hagar really have? She's, she's kind of got that mountain hanging over her head. So if we look at this shared experience at Sinai, then we can look at two things. Number one, it shows the tremendous power of Adonai to judge our hearing, how we're hearing the word, and how we're doing the word. And we, we sense that because of the mountain over our heads. The thunder, the lightning, the earthquakes, the violent rushing wind, the fire, the smoke. Of course, all that's going to scare you to death. And that's when you realize the power of death and sin. And that's what Moses says. This, he's doing this in order to test you so that you may not sin. So you can understand exactly what he's saving you from with his word. So... It's so you can recognize his immense power, but also to understand he calls us in this shared experience. And he is giving to us the freedom to hear and to do his word with those around us. 
his word is, is very general. And how we apply that word to one another is entirely up to us. For instance, like if you're a farmer and you're supposed to leave the corners to the gleaners, then he doesn't tell you how big the corners have to be. You get to decide how much you share. It's the same thing with a lot of your sacrifices. How many people do you want to invite to a holy meal? How far do you want to go to help your neighbor with a fallen donkey? There's, there's a lot of flexibility in how much we choose to do for one another. And so that really tells the tale. He can gauge the strength of our relationship with him by seeing how we interact with one another. Because if a mountain were hanging over our heads, if, if we were having a disagreement with a friend or an enemy, but if it's a person of like kind and like mind, if the mountain literally picked up and held over our heads and we heard thunder, we saw lightning, we, you know, there was smoke, there was fire, and there was an earthquake under our feet, I think we would very quickly resolve our differences but it would be from a negative fear. But that's not something we should leave out. When we are engaging a difference with someone, we need to smell a little smoke overhead because it's, it will encourage us to think about the consequences of how I choose to negotiate this disagreement. And so, in the long run, if I'm good to my neighbor, not out of love, but out of negative fear, I've still been good to my neighbor. And then we'll live to, to have another disagreement and do better the next time. We can grow in this from just having an awe and reverence of the power of Adonai to growing in our love toward our neighbor, which will tell him we're also in growing in love toward him. But see, he, he's left us in a condition where for the most part, we know a few stories about people who committed a transgression and like, yeah, they literally did drop dead or a train hit them or a car ran over them or whatever. Those are few and far in between. Most of us experience delayed punishment. And when we feel like we're getting away with something, when we feel like that mountain is not hanging just over our heads, then it is easier to steal. It is easier to murder, to lie. Because like Adam and Eve, you know, for hundreds of years, maybe they thought they were getting away with it. But they weren't. They were eventually going to die and face consequences. And so it's, it's in this little holding pin of how we behave toward one another in this shared experience that is really telling him how strong our faith is in Adonai and in his power to ultimately judge that behavior. And that's what scripture says. When death or punishment are delayed after a, a sin, especially a murder, then it emboldens, to peop, it emboldens people to sin more because they don't feel the mountain hanging over their heads. If you look at... Um, you know, television footage of looting. Um, people will just pour into a store. Once it's breached open, you will see people pouring into a store and just helping themselves to whatever is on the shelves because they feel like there will be no accountability. It's a riot. They'll never pick me out of a crowd. Plus, this is a special condition, so it's not really a crime. And so, They've simply taken opportunism to sin, reframed it, and flexed it, and said, I'm entitled to live. There's stuff here to be had. I want stuff, and so this is living. But it's not living. It's stealing. And you can see what I mean about the mountain, because if there are police around a store, if there's cameras in a store, if the proprietor has a sawed off shotgun under the counter and they know it, it definitely tamps down the behavior because there's a mountain hanging over their heads. There's an immediate consequence if they start taking things off the shelf. 
And so this person in your neighborhood who owns this store, you don't love that person. There's just a mountain hanging over your head that prevents you from stealing from his store on a normal day because you fear punishment. And that's kind of where he leaves us. In the absence of that powerful divine presence, the looter, even in this shared experience, is going to flex the commandment. You're, you're much less likely to identify yourself with we, as in we will do and we will hear, unless it is to identify with we will loot <laughs> and we will not fear. It's, it's a different mindset when you don't feel like there's going to be any consequences for the theft. This is not your brother. You're not thinking of that shared experience that the person who owns the store or the people who own the store are actually your brother and sister. Now, is there a condition where looting might be okay? I think so. If, like, say there is a hurricane, and you need food or you need water to survive in that case i think it's okay but i think you have to make it right as soon as possible you have to leave a note leave a number like if you hit a car you don't just drive off you leave your name and your phone number so they can get in touch with you or you leave your insurance information so they can get in touch with you these are things where there's extenuating circumstances and the commandment can flex to that because you're supposed to live in the commandment, not die in it. Someone who's looting during a riot is not starving to death. They're not, they're not about, you know, to die of thirst. They're just looting because they want TVs or whatever's behind the counter. And so, if we were in that same position and all of a sudden a mountain hung over our heads, we would become crystal clear on how we should treat one another. We would know instinctively if that mountain hung over our heads, what to do to obey the commandment. And we would start putting things back on the shelf. There would be no flexing of the, the thinking frame at all. We would not be trying to twist and, and, you know, mess with the commandment like Plato to fit it into what we want. Instead, the commandment would be hard, it would be fast, and we would have total clarity. But when the presence is not evident, it's less clear, and that's when we start turning it into Plato. And again, this doesn't just apply to riots or looting, what about in our relationships with one another? Because at Sinai, it's, it's people of like kind and like mind, and they're going to have disputes. That's, remember, the, the way the, the portion starts out, people are standing in lines all day to talk to Moses because they have disputes. And so I'm just wondering how different it was after Sinai, if that just cleared up, you know, 99% of the disputes, <laughs> because all of a sudden you would have perfect clarity because a mountain hung over your head. But when that mountain isn't hanging there, then I think we're less inclined to have clarity. When you know, we have this shared experience and it becomes a matter of winning the argument or winning what is the right way to do things. It's easy to forget the mountain is right over our heads. And we'll, we'll lose a little bit of that heavenly awe. And we won't necessarily be thinking about what may our unfinished business be when he calls us into the cloud. But how we deal with one another is, is basically proof of how we are sharing in him out of love, not fear of punishment. Because if I love you, I will probably navigate my, my argument or my disagreement with you in a completely different way than if I'm only seeing a mountain hanging over my head. Because if I don't feel the mountain, then I'll treat you differently. But if I love you, it's as if the mountain were there, but without fear. 
Instead, it's just reverence and awe of the Holy One that says, you know what? I love the Father and I love this person, even though I disagree with them right now. And so I want to treat them well, not because I fear punishment, but because I love them. That is just like a family argument. It's okay. We're not going to kill each other over it. Uh, but this is the preparation we have. He turns us loose with each other to see how we'll treat each other, to see how we're treating him. The Egyptians had a preparation period. And it got them ready for the death of the firstborn. They had three days of darkness to get ready for the death of the firstborn. And that darkness isolated them in their shared experience. Right? See, at Sinai, there's clarity about who you are, who he is, and who's around you. In the darkness, they probably had clarity about, you know, who the true creator of the universe was, but they really didn't have any clarity about what was around them. They had no awareness of one another. They became isolated, even in that shared experience. And I would say this is death. There's a, there's a feeling of loneliness. Uh, even though these souls might be collected and sharing in this captivity experience, the darkness makes them to feel isolated. And they're really unable to grow in a shared experience with other human beings, just like in this conversation with the rich man and Lazarus and Father Abraham. They're cut off, even within that experience. And it, we know from the beginning, it says it's not tov, it's not good for a human to be alone. And this condition of tov, if we look at the first mentions, it's in the creation. Tov is for the garden of life. Very tov is for the garden of life. And so in order to experience this tov, this goodness, the Israelites at Sinai had to prepare their garments for three days. So whereas the Egyptians prepared in darkness to give up their firstborn, the Israelites are preparing in, a, in an attitude of purity for three days because it's going to extend this covenant, the words, the hearing and the doing, the entire family is going to be there together. And so this Torah is going to extend into their firstborn, the next generation. It was something that was intended to be perpetually transformative. Why? Because it was a body of shared experience, those who are standing here and those who are not. Because even if we weren't literally there, we were there. We are part of that body. We experience the thunder and the lightning. And this is different from the moral relativism that we have today. And it's not a new religion. It's a very old religion. It just takes on different forms in every generation. But... If you think the Ten Commandments are not different from every other culture, every other culture's moral laws. They're pretty much the same across cultures. The one thing that distinguishes the Ten Commandments is who spoke them in a divine utterance, in a shared experience with an entire nation. The creator of the universe revealed himself. These words didn't come from an astrologer, a shaman, a king, a committee, a priest. The one thing that distinguishes these Ten Commandments is who spoke them. And so this is what sets the Torah apart from all other moral laws on earth. And so if we accept who gave these commandments, then because of their unchanging nature, we can't flex those commandments to fit what's relative in our generation. And that's exactly what we see now. I, I saw um, news headlines this morning. Uh, one of them is that I think it's Virginia is trying to change their laws so that it's legal now for unmarried people to, you know, have sex. And so they were right the first time, you know, 
it should be reserved for married people. But now because we feel like we're a different generation and, and you know, we're, we're a lot smarter today than they were back whenever Virginia passed that law, we need to go back and fix the law based on the way we feel about it today. Well, in Torah, that's always going to be wrong. That's not going to flex. And so the one thing that's going to set it apart is the one who spoke it is not a human being. A human being can be replaced, can be replaced by election. It's, it's not you know, a religion that's going to change, not a human priest who's going to replace by somebody who lets you serve new gods or start a new denomination. It's not an astrologer who's going to read the signs and say, well, you know, I read it this way, but this astrologer reads it. it he's not like that. It's not changeable. And so even though how you apply the commandment can flex into a new generation, I think especially a new technology, you know, we've had to think through, well, if you're not supposed to kindle a fire on Shabbat, how do we deal with electricity? These are the sorts of things that Jews deal with, not changing the commandment, figuring out how the commandment can still be applied within a new technology. But murder will always be wrong. Stealing will always be wrong. Sexual immorality will always be wrong. And they're wrong because of who spoke the commandments. Not just because the squad woke up this morning and decided this is what the law of the day will be. Humanly manufactured morality is, it may have characteristics of the divine, but it will change with human beings. He will never change. And that's what sets these laws apart. Because Hammurabi had a code of very uh, similar laws. Buddha has similar moral laws. Confucius has similar wisdom literature. So what sets it apart? Who gave it? The author of the words, the originator, the creator. And Rabbi Khan suggested, and he's, he's commenting on this Torah portion, one way to remember the source of the commandments is to each day try to hear the echoes of the thunder and the lightning that accompanies them. That's powerful. In other words, whenever you're consciously engaging a commandment, let the Holy Spirit breathe through it like it did in Acts chapter 2. You know, if you're having a conversation with somebody at work about, you know, how you don't want to come in on Saturday, can I switch days with you? I'm not saying you have to breathe out fire and consume them. But I'm saying the fire needs to be inside of you. The thunder and the lightning of the commandment about Shabbat needs to be inside of you so that they know that you are earnest, that you're not playing games, that you're trying to get off for this Shabbat, but if something fun comes up, like family vacation next Shabbat, then the rules are going to change. Well, then it's okay. If the fire is there, you're not going to be doing Play-Doh figures with the commandments, they will feel your conviction. They don't need to feel terrified, but they need to feel your conviction. Just like the disciples felt that flame of fire inscribing the word on them because they realized they had a shared experience. And then they had a responsibility, not just to the father, but they had a responsibility to one another. And, you know, it goes back to acknowledging the source. Today, nobody wants to give credit to Adonai for morality because they, want, they know they might change it. What was good yesterday may not be good with me today. It just kind of goes according to how I feel or what the last thing that was said on, you know, the Oscars or the Grammys or whatever. What the latest movie star said was morality is what I think is morality. It doesn't work that way. 
we have to acknowledge the source and the source won't change his words. But when people have to acknowledge the source, it changes everything because then they are no longer the source of deciding what morality is. But we can always quote our sources. We, we don't have to steal what came from the divine. And in the same breath, because it's a shared experience, we don't have to steal from one another. We can acknowledge our sources. If we can acknowledge Adonai as the source of the commandments, then it shouldn't be any trouble to acknowledge others as sources. For instance, if we're quoting, and this is called academic integrity, but it goes for any kind of integrity, because we're talking about words. When we quote the Talmud, or we quote Strong's Concordance, or you know, a biblical commentary, any source, we have to acknowledge that particular idea, that interpretation, that definition we got out of Strong's. We didn't originate it. We were not the creator of it. We did not create the commandments. They did not originate within us. That's what the world believes today, that they have the power to create the divine. And therefore they have the right to make new commandments, get rid of old ones, because they refuse to acknowledge the source. They want to be the source, but they are not the source. And so how do we practice understanding we are not the source of goodness? That goodness is simply planted within us to give glory back to the source. He puts goodness in us, we guard it, we work it, we invite the rivers of life, the Holy Spirit, to continue producing fruit within us with tongues of fire. But we have to credit the source. Simply just being a tree bearing good fruit is not evidence that the tree created itself. It's not evidence that the tree created its own goodness. It's only evident that it's being consistent with what was planted within it. The truly good tree has to acknowledge its creator and has to acknowledge its source, where it's getting its water from, where it's getting its food from. So even though the fruit it bears is the result of the food and the water and the air and the so forth, or carbon dioxide that it's breathing in, and it's its own unique fruit, it still has to acknowledge the source, the raw materials. And in our case, we have to acknowledge the creator as the originator of all good that's planted within us. But when we don't have that faith that there really is a creator Elohim, that there really is a mountain hanging over our heads, then we're like that looter walking by an unguarded store because we don't feel the mountain. We don't feel any impending danger of punishment or being exposed as a thief. We just take from the shelves anything that looks good or if it looks useful, we take off the price tag and then we display it as our own. But it isn't our own. We have to pay the price. An apple tree can't turn to the apple tree beside it and say, give me your fruit. They're feeding from the same ground. They're feeding from the same water. They're getting the same atmospheric conditions. Basically, they're getting the same trimming. <laughs> Some branches are a little hard to reach, but they're basically getting the same treatment. So this apple tree has to yield its apple, and this one has to yield its. I can't take the apple off of that tree and say, that's my apple. Uh, Rabbi Lux last week gave the example of, uh, if you steal someone else's lulav, in order to keep the mitzvah of the lulav at Sukkot, have you really kept the mitzvah? 
Can you keep the mitzvah if you're stealing from somebody else in order to do it? But that happens a lot because we don't really wanna pay the price to acquire that fruit from the commandment. We don't really want to acknowledge the source. We want to be seen as the source. But having that shared experience in the commandments, that's what gives us the opportunity to share all good things with one another, not to steal them from one another. And most people are pretty good about citing sources. They're saying, you know what, I didn't come up with this idea all myself. Now, this is my unique, unique take on this. I read this over here, but this is how I'm putting it together with other things. That's what you should be doing. That's what the rabbis always did. They would always say, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this in the name of Rabbi so-and-so, and then here's what I'm saying. They told where the original ideas were coming from. Why? So they wouldn't be tempted to steal and glorify themselves where they have actually just taken someone else's fruit and tried to pass it off as their own. You can take someone else's fruit and say, but this is the way I'm interpreting it. This is the way I'm implying. I'm going to take this fruit and I'm going to put it with this one and this one and this one and this one. And this is my own. This is my own unique idea that I want to put with this. But you still have to credit the source. Because if you look at this list of Ten Commandments, how many of them have as their essence taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? In other words, taking something that does not belong to you. It's a boundary you weren't supposed to cross. And pretty much it's the essence of all of them. Because if you violate or if you don't do that, whether it's positive or negative, you will in some way diminish someone else. You will take something that is theirs for yourself. And so we, we have to be conscious of that. And that's why I use Galatians as an example. Um, not just because Paul writes about the Hagar relationship of the, the mountain hanging over your head versus a relationship of love. I just want to do the right thing because of the spirit that he has also planted within me, that I understand that without you as my neighbor, as my fellow student, or as my fellow teacher, or as my whatever, I don't stand alone. I will have to be judged alone, but he has given me you to improve my relationship with him. And so he writes of this. When the people come in, the, the faction comes in and tells, starts telling the Galatians they have to be circumcised immediately. And Paul reminds them of some things. He says, look, how much time I spent with you. He spent a lot of time with the Galatians. And then he moves on and an outside faction comes in and starts demanding circumcision, not because they truly believe it, but they want to display their authority and their evangelistic success over the Galatians. They're wanting to take honor or goodness, the tove, but it didn't originate in them. And Paul was always very careful to give credit, to cite the source, all the way to the divine source for the honor, the glory, the power, and the so forth. But this group is wanting to take the honor for themselves. And so what they end up doing is confusing the Galatians. And he reminds them how much he had already invested in their relationship and their shared experience laying down that foundational teaching with them and now another group comes in and they're distracted and this is why it says in Pirkei Avot make a teacher for yourself because distraction will always be the thief of good teaching and it's important to have that discipline it's important to maintain that relationship with your teacher so that when someone comes in and teaches someone else, then they're able 
you know, basically to work through that problem, if it's a textual problem, to work through it with you. Now, when you're separated by maybe hundreds of miles, like Paul was, he's experiencing the same difficulty we are. When we're separated by space, words are often misunderstood. Letters are often misunderstood. We can know, verify that when we read Paul. It's easy to misunderstand what he meant, especially when you take it out of context. And so here's what he writes to the foolish Galatians. And foolish, by the way, it means simple. Like, you'll believe anything. He says, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things. That Greek word there is agathos, with the one who teaches him. Now, agathos is cognate to tov in Hebrew. And so in the Strong's, where it's giving you the context of Agathos from the Hebrew, it gives us a citation of Jeremiah 33.11. And Jeremiah 33.11 links us back to Shavuot, where he says, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. There's our tov. For his loving kindness is everlasting, and of those who bring a thank offering into the house of the Lord. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were at first, says the Lord. All right, so we know this is prophecy, but the context is wonderful for helping us understand what Paul is talking about when he says, the one who is taught should share all good things with the one who teaches. What he's saying is, as the student is sharing in the teaching, so the fruit of that teaching, which goes back to the thank offering, so the fruit of that teaching and the student is to be shared with the teacher. In other words, we have a shared experience. We are experiencing the word together. We're a tiny group, but this tiny group is part of a greater group but our experience is unique because we're the ones here right now sharing this experience. And so we're a part of one another. If I were to do something incredibly stupid that became public, and I'm not planning to, by the way, but if I were to do something incredibly stupid in public that everybody would find out about, and people knew that we studied together, they would come to you for an explanation of my behavior because we've had a shared experience. And they would say, what's going on with this person? What can you tell me? Why? Because we've shared this experience of the word. Maybe you could shed light on it. All right, of course, some things, you're just no accountant for what people will do. The same thing, if, if for instance, if I were disrespected by you know, another teacher's student or mentee, in this one case I'm thinking of, I didn't confront the, the mentee first, I confronted the mentor. And I said, is this what you're teaching? The answer is no, this was just, a, a, you know, an immature behavior. Okay, now I can go back because I wanna know, did you learn this from your teacher? Because no matter what the doctrine is, I don't care. Disrespect is pretty universal. I get that. And so that's something that has to be dealt with. But they had a shared experience. And in scripture, we kind of hold one another accountable when we have a shared experience. And so he's saying, there's going to be a pattern here where we're going to go back, it says, as at the beginning, at the creation, when the days were called tov, and they were called very tov. Good. And they say that the, the relationship of ministry is one of goodness that must be shared with one another. And so that's the setting, the bridegroom and the bride, which we've already said, you know, the spirit and the bride say, come. Why? because they've been thirsty. 
and now they can cross into the garden. They will never thirst again. But the bridegroom and the bride in this prophecy are going to speak as at the beginning in the garden of Toph, of goodness. Before the seductive words of the serpent started confusing the unity of that relationship. And so you think of when the serpents came in and started biting the Israelites in the wilderness. We know what went wrong. The unity of the relationship had been broken. The same way that it was in the garden. By using words, we confuse the unity of the relationship, especially the, the foundational relationship, where the second comes in and tries to subvert the first. And so in Jeremiah, our second context, it's, he talks about a thank offering in the house of Adonai. You can only offer a thank offering as a shared experience as you take it into the temple. And then it speaks of five voices or kolot. And it gives it to you in couplets. Where it says the voice of joy <clears throat> and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. So there's two couplets. It basically gives you a city of four. But remember, Kiryat Arba, Hebron, the entrance to the garden was the city of four. So we've got a joyful bridegroom and we've got a glad bride speaking in those voices. But then these couplets, they're summarized in a fifth voice. It says, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good. In other words, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, they're citing the source. They're not trying to steal thanks. They're not trying to steal goodness. They're giving credit to the source of all goodness. The one who created with his voice. And in fact, there's actually a sixth voice. This is 506. This is going to be one of those cases. Because it clarifies, it says, and of those who bring a thank offering, a todah into the house of the Lord. And as you look at the definition there from Strong's, what do you see? It's, it does have the sense of a shared experience, the extension of the hand, an avowal, a choir of worshipers. In other words, it's a collective experience to give thanks. You can give thanks to Adonai, but it's much different when you give thanks to him in a crowd of like-minded worshipers. So Paul is not asking for the Galatians to worship him as a teacher. He's just asking for the respect of the relationship because it pictures their relationship with the father. And see, when the faction comes in, they start confusing the Galatians. All of a sudden, we have competing teachers. Well, Paul said this. Well, this guy said that. But he's reminding them of their original relationship. And the Bible describes it as striking hands with someone. He said, look, we had this shared experience. And you need to acknowledge your source here. And, and in some cases, you can say, well, thank your source. With what? With one, some sort of offering. Share the fruit. But Paul is not opposed to other teachers building on his work. He did the same thing himself. I mean, he'll cite other teachers like Apollos or Phoebe, and, and he's like, you know, we shouldn't go around saying, well, I'm a student of Apollo or I'm a student of Paul. He says, don't do that. There's one who is your teacher, the teacher. But if you're learning things from other teachers, and this is, of course, uh, one of the ministries established from ancient times, then you need to credit that source. You need to respect that foundational worker. And you will build on it. But you have to be alert that there's going to be other teachers, other factions like in Galatia, who will come in and try to usurp that foundational work. And what they were trying to do is 
to get the credit for whatever honor might come out of this, this thing that they're teaching, but they're stealing from the relationship with Paul's students and Paul. They're not enhancing what was already there. That's what teachers should do for teachers. And so if you learn from different teachers, then it should be an enhancement, but it should not be stealing from that original relationship simply for the honor of saying, I taught you more than so-and-so. Because there's only one that deserves a thank offering. It's just in this shared relationship, Paul says, this is how the Father can watch us and understand how we truly feel about him. And so how would you give thanks to a teacher? How would you share all good things with a teacher? Well, having been a teacher most of my life, um, I tried to sum it up in three things. Service the relationship. Be present as much as you can. Pray for your teacher. Participate with your teacher. Because your presence does matter even though we're kind of in a strange situation where we're disconnected by space, uh, as much as you can, I love it when you guys send me emails, you know, uh, and tell me how this applied in your life or how this encouraged you or how you have found a new way to apply something in your life. That's servicing the relationship. That's sharing those good things back with the teacher because see, I have to do the same thing with my teachers. They don't want to feel like they're throwing their efforts into a, you know, a black hole where they're not doing anybody any good. They want to see the fruit of their ministry in me. And I want to see the fruit of my ministry in you. But if you'll notice, Paul didn't send letters to people he didn't spend time with. And that's why a lot of times if someone just emails me and I don't really know them, I won't answer them. You know, or I might direct them somewhere else, or I might direct them to their local congregation. But if I haven't spent time with you, then we haven't really serviced that relationship or that shared experience with one another. I don't really know what your motivation is. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if, if you're honest or if you're a faction. Um, and secondly, you know, just applying the teaching in a life of excellence that tove, you know, living a tove life of bearing fruit. That's how you give thanks to a teacher because then I'm sharing in your experience. And then third, uh, be faithful to give credit. Uh, monetary compensation, that's just one type of sharing with a teacher but cite your sources faithfully. And, and that includes like, if you're using a Strong's Concordance, then tell where you got that. If you're using a, a rabbinic commentary, tell where you found it. Now, you don't have to give page number unless you're, you're actually writing something academic or something that people will wanna go and look up the actual page number. But you need to do that if you're writing a paper or writing a book or something, you have to do that. But in general, people need to be able to go find that information where you found it. That's integrity. And if it's something that's in the public domain, it's, it's a little bit different. If it's something everybody knows, you don't have to give credit. Right? And But in terms of taking somebody's idea, somebody's teaching, we have to give credit to the person where we found it. You know, to the point, I think in one of the workbooks I wrote in the footnote, I don't know the lady's name who said this, but she was in Florida at a Bible study and I have to give her credit, whoever she is. <laughs> this was not my idea originally. And the reason this is important, especially if we're using reference books or we're using another teacher's material to quote from, is because if we don't give credit to that source, 
eventually that mountain over our head will, will call in the debt. That teacher may never find out, the publisher of that book may never find out, the person you quoted from may have been dead for 3,000 years. And so, you know, we might feel like we can loot that store. But eventually, we will have to account for it. And in our next Torah portion, in Mishpatim, it gives us a general paradigm. Exodus 22, 1, it says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Right? But it says, if what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or sheep, he shall pay double. So in the first case, it's a little more serious. He took it. And then he actually profited. He made money off of it. Or he filled his own belly with it. He didn't purchase it. He didn't pay the price for it. He didn't suffer to obtain that thing. But then he passed it off as his own in order to increase himself. In the second case, it's a little lighter. The penalty is a little lighter because he still has it. He hasn't tried to resell it yet. So he might be contemplating repentance. He could be having second thoughts. He knows that's not his. He's reluctant to profit from it. And the penalty is he, he just has to double the value of what he stole. This might be the person who just wants the esteem of others who, who just think, well, you know, um, maybe they'll think I'm smarter if I pass off this idea as my own, if I basically rewrite this book and put my name on it. Um, but he's unwilling to charge money, maybe. Maybe he's giving it away. Well, you, again, can you steal the lulav <laughs> to keep the mitzvah? No. Um, just because people see you with the lulav and they give you the esteem for doing the mitzvah doesn't mean that it's not stealing. And so for some people, esteem is the currency. They're still going to have to restore what they stole. If you stole someone's lulav, you're going to have to give it back to them and give them another one. Um, and it's, it's easy to calculate losses when we're talking about ox or sheep, but that's why we have courts. And of course, um, our difficulty is we are so divided in terms of denomination and so forth. But in the time that the Brit was written, it's, the, it's a very old rabbinic idea is you don't go to a secular government when you have issues between you, somebody with the shared experience, somebody else living in the Torah, if they're stealing from you, or they're slandering you, or they're plagiarizing you, then you need to have people of like mind and like kind to actually adjudicate that dispute. Um, of course, I don't know when that would ever happen with our kind of people, where you would actually have uh, some way of litigating and saying, hey, this idea was stolen from me, or this book, the contents of this book has been plagiarized, or this person has slandered me, and people actually believe I did this. Um, that's why we need judges. And that's why, you know, it says restore our judges as in ancient times in the daily prayer, because at this point, who do we go to if we don't go? Um, Maybe your local fellowship, if it's something within your local fellowship. Um, but it's, it's hard to know who to go to in order to make these things right. And the ideas and the words, and I call them tongues, are so plentiful today on the internet and so plentiful in the media and so plentiful because everybody's got an iPhone and they never look up because they're on the phone talking. They can't stand to be alone with themselves. 
uh, even in a waiting room, I'm like, good grief, did you really want everybody in the waiting room to know your business? And you're thinking, well, I guess they did because they talk so loud. But the words, there's so many words out there and they're so available that we're, we see them stolen like looters. You know, you see this a lot on uh, like social media. You'll see others stealing and you say, well, everybody else is pasting this picture on the internet. Uh, why can't I? But, you know, you really have to look and, and see, is this copyrighted? Is this trademarked? Is this someone else's words? And just because the material is out there, it doesn't mean it's yours for the taking to pass off as your own. There's a whole website that tries to replicate mine. And I, at this point, I'm just like, I'm just going to let that ride. I mean, they've got every creation gospel video, which is copyrighted to Hebraic Roots Network. It's not even mine, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's copyrighted to someone else. And they have built a website that would make you think that was me. And here are my videos. And I don't know these people from anybody. The, the menorah graphic that people see on the creation gospel all the time is copyrighted. You see it everywhere. How many people have asked, is it okay if I put this here? But most of the time we get in the mindset, like, well, you know what? I'm helping promote this pastor or teacher or minister or this writer. They should be glad I'm replicating their material and just putting it out there for free. And the word of God is free. That's the, that's the little Plato thing you hear a lot when people just don't want to pay for something. There are so many teachers and websites out there. It's not really stealing. It's the information age. We're, we're trying to flex with the technology and make the commandment flex with it. But the commandment just says, do not steal. And if it's not yours, ask if you can use it. If it's not yours, then write within the legal limits. If you're writing a book and you quote another book, there's a limit as to how many words you can quote. And if you want to quote more than that, you have to write and ask permission. And you can do it. It's just an extra step. And most people are glad to grant you permission as long as you're not trying to quote a whole chapter. They're glad for you to share it. They just want to make sure that the source is given credit. Just because we're in an information age doesn't make it okay to slide into moral relativity. We can't be word looters. Uh, so yes, give your unique take on I do it every week, but I'll tell you where I found the information so that you can go find it too. Uh, and this is something I think Suzanne brought up, is when you fail to cite a source, when you're passing off a teaching as your own and you don't tell people where you found that particular fact or piece of information, then you're even depriving them of the opportunity to go back and benefit from reading the same material that you did. They could be enriching themselves as well with that source. That's what I do typically with a book that I really enjoy. I'll look at the references and I might end up buying or borrowing some of the books that were referenced to learn more about it. And so that's where I get this comparison with the, the faction that comes in with the Galatians. They're, they're wanting to strip the honor from the Galatians and take it from themselves. Um, and just by the way, in case you didn't know it, when someone writes something and posts it on the internet, and I know probably Bonnie has run into this too because she does blogs, Keisha does blogs. When they write a blog, even a blog, it's considered legally published and therefore it needs to be cited just like a book. 
copyrighted material is still copyrighted material. And it doesn't matter how many people have been in that store before you, it's still stealing. And I don't know that everybody knows this. Because when we're writers, we have to know what the law is so that we don't get in trouble by quoting too many words from someone else's material. So that we know how to cite and stay out of trouble. Uh, because typically, you know, a small person is not going to go after you, but a big corporation will. They've got the liars to come after you. Uh, but with one another, we have a shared experience and we're typically happy for our material to be shared because we know who our ultimate source is. But if we have that shared experience, then we honor one another. And the way that we honor one another is say, this is where I got this. You know, we, we've got a young man that teaches at our congregation. Well, actually, um, everybody that teaches at our congregation, I've noticed as they're teaching, they're very careful to tell if they got something from a certain source. And that kind of honesty, the Father honors. Because if we're honest with one another, then we can be honest with him and say, yes, you were the source of this commandment, and I have no right to rewrite it the way that it feels good. Um, but that's what we saw, even after that shared experience with the divine presence at Sinai, we saw the thefts continued. Some people wanted the priesthood. Some people wanted to depose Moses and go back to Egypt. Some people just said, I'm going to defy the commandments. Others just complained themselves and others literally to death. <laughs> so we have to be careful. When we do get discouraged, and we will, and when we complain, and we will, even though we shouldn't, we will, contain that damage that can be done. Because we have a shared experience with those we're in fellowship with. And if all we ever do is complain and, and talk about how we're victimized by the world for walking with Yeshua, then we're losing some opportunities, number one, to encourage, but I think we're damaging their experience with the Father. Because remember that mountain hanging over our heads. When all we hear is discouragement stories, it seems like the presence is farther away. Like, where is the Father? And the farther we think the presence is from us, the more it encourages that looting and stealing. And what we would be looting and stealing, there would be the joy of the bridegroom and the bride. And so we have to find ways to speak tov, to speak goodness. With the thunder, with the lightning, even when things go wrong. Even when they go wrong. We have to find the good. And so Rabbi Khan says significantly, the events at the sea take place on the seventh day after they left Egypt, the day husband and wife are reunited after the wife immerses in the mikvah. So that is interesting. That's an interesting fact. But there's an even more mystical connection that he makes. And um, I typically don't like to cite from the Zohar, but he does. And so I follow that um, commentary to see what it said and I felt like it was valid. I think I think it's a good quote in terms of what we know about this shared experience. He says in the Zohar there uh, it speaks of the uh, additional seven day period when we're talking about the counting from Passover to Shavuot and instead of counting seven days and mikvah, they actually counted seven weeks. 
and then they washed. They had a purification. So the purification that marks the period between Pesach and Shavuot or between Exodus and Revelation is the seven sevens, the seven weeks. And uh, the mystics, when they were speaking about this, they extended this period of purification in order to be immersed in more powerful waters than what they experienced at the Sea of Reeds. Because at the Sea of Reeds, remember, they're leaving death behind. They're leaving Egypt behind. And here's what it says in the commentary to Leviticus. It says that they might be worthy to be cleansed by the waters of that stream, which is called living waters, and from which issue seven Sabbaths, which makes us think of the Garden of Eden, the, the rivers of Eden. When Israel drew near to Mount Sinai, that dew that descends from the supernal point came down in its fullness and purified them so that their filth left them, and they became attached to the Holy King and the community of Israel and receive the Torah. And so do remember represents resurrection. And so knowing what the rabbinic mindset is about at the giving of the commandments after each one, they would die and he would have to resurrect them with do. This is some sort of cross reference here where we know do symbolizes resurrection, but it also symbolizes the words of Torah in the Song of Moses, Yeshua being the living word, being that point of resurrection. And remember, there was also the rabbinic understanding that once this process is completed at Sinai, that they would be able to ascend to the land and immortality. They would be returned to the garden. Of course, the golden calf came in and messed up that plan. But uh, the idea that this shared experience that we undergo a shared purification because we're going to share in the living waters, in the, the rivers of Eden. But first, even though we've got this married identity that even Jeremiah prophesied of, we saw first that Moses had the husbands and wives separate for three days prior to the thunder and the lightning and the fire on the mountain. So their marriages, even the existing marriages, were about to move into a more mystical relationship. In the same way that the community now is going to be married to the Holy One, so the relationship even between husbands and wives would change. And this is where the rabbis say there were two marriages at Sinai because of this period of separation Yes, Israel and the Holy One, but also wives and husbands were remarried in a union this time based on holiness, not based on whatever happened in Egypt. But now that they have come and made covenant with the Holy One as a nation, now even their individual marriages are going to be revived with the dew of heaven. And to this day, if you were to convert to Judaism and you were already married, then after your conversion, you would be remarried to your spouse as an acknowledgement that by receiving the covenant of the Torah together, that it is going to transform your relationship with your spouse. You're gonna have a new perception of him or her. You're no longer masters and slaves. There's no Hagars in this relationship anymore. But we're receiving this commandments and love, not the mountain hanging over our heads. But now we're, we're children of Sarah and children of Abraham. And when a convert is called up for an Aliyah to read from the Torah in the synagogue, because they may not have a parent who is Jewish or has a Hebrew name, then they will be called daughter of Sarah or daughter of Abraham when they're called up because now their relationship is one of thunder, lightning, and fire of the good kind. So I know we went long here, but you're going to have a lot of time <laughs> between now and when I get back. 
Um, but that is the plan. Next Monday night, you're invited into the Monday night class with Rabbi Krieger. The following late week, we will not likely have class on Monday and Tuesday. The likelihood is that I will move it to Thursday if there's no flight delays coming back and so forth, unless I can figure out a way to get enough signal to hold the class. Um, but I, unless something has changed drastically, I don't, I don't think there's enough Wi-Fi to get that where we could actually communicate for more than a few minutes. Um, but if so, I'll try to move it to Thursday night. Hopefully I'll have some really interesting things to tell you after the dig. Um, what else? When I send out the link today, I'll remind you of the schedule. It'll be on there with the dates. I'm also attaching a document um, written by Tali Erickson, who is the, the main archeologist down at Tamar Park. Um, and so if you're interested in archeology, span you may not be. It, it just may be too dry and dusty <laughs> for you. But if you like archeology, span I've included one of her papers about the fortress there at Tamar so that you can kind of see the type of work that they'll be doing. Um, and then I also put the website, the academic website, where I think for free, probably I've got a subscription because of my scholar stuff, but I think anybody can get into at least some of the papers there at academia. Dot edu. So I, I put that link on there. Uh, and then I put a reminder there about Passover, if you want to meet us there for Passover. Um, but it'll have that information. And uh, so it's probably going to be a couple weeks till I see you again. Um, but also remember right now, one of our students, Robin Gould, um, I think she's actually I've had her on before to talk about a specific topic. Uh, her husband, Dave, right now is in the hospital. Uh, his platelet count, I think, was two. I don't know what that means, but I know it's very low. And so it's just, it's very serious. Um, Dave and Robin were with us at Passover last year at Tamar. Um, but he needs prayer, for sure. Uh, 